Israel is today, they'll take you to the upper room that they say that may be the actual location. However, since Jerusalem has been destroyed several times and it's under 30 feet of rubble, the streets that you're walking under today are to on today when you do the Via Della Rosa are 30 feet above ground level where Jesus walked. So it's hard for me to imagine that that room is actually the upper room because it was probably consecrated before the Crusades in the 7th or 8th century. And Constantine's mother picked out all the holy places in Israel and decided with a trip, you know, I think in the 4th century, to try to determine where all the locations were. And then they put churches everywhere, she said, you know, where, where, the, where the garden was, where the cross was. And we're pretty well convinced that Calvary was where that church stands today. Because when you go underneath the cross, is they, you climb up some stairs, and there's a beautiful ornate silver, beautiful crucifix of Christ. Everything's in silver and gold up there. It's amazing the wealth that, was, that it took to build that church. And underneath it, people, if you've ever been there, you'll see people stooping to put their hand down through a circle. And when you do, you're touching the top of the rock, Mount Calvary. Well, I found a private guide uh, on my day off, and he took me into the belly of the church. And you could see that the church was built around a great big stone rock called Calvary. Now, years later, an Englishman has determined that that the garden tomb was where Christ was buried, and that wasn't discovered until the 1800s. So for 1800 years of Christianity, they did not look at that site as the burial place because it was outside the gates. And this would have been outside the gates of Jerusalem at the time where the church was erected. The walls you see now were built by the Muslims, the walls surrounding Jerusalem. So we learn a lot by looking at history and trying to go back and studying that, but here's the things that took place prior to the washing of the disciples' feet. They found the upper room and it was prepared. It was a Passover meal and they were gonna celebrate the Passover meal together and if you've ever been around that, it's uh, basically four courses and it takes a while. That they, they have points where they remember the bondage and they they eat horseradish and different things and have these the big, I call it a big cracker that they break, the matzah bread, and they hide a portion of it. And then the youngest child present co commemorates the Exodus story and tells it as best as he can. So you have a child reciting what happened. And then they, they have the four course meal, which is followed, each course followed by a glass of wine. So four big glasses of wine might explain why they fell asleep in the garden. But that was a Paschal meal where they had the Passover lamb. It was roasted and they, they, partake, they partook of all this, this big meal, really. But on this particular occasion, Jesus was a little bit surprised when they came in the room because it was not an orderly evening. James and John along with their mother, Salome, had caused quite a stir. Do you remember what it was about? Why were, James, why were, the, why were the, the 12 disciples, 10 of them, upset with James and John? Because they had asked, they put their mother up to asking Jesus a special favor. Now we do know that Peter, James, and John were among the closest disciples of Jesus, but this would have left Peter out of the mix altogether because they wanted to be on Jesus' right and left hand in heaven. And that was the favor that Salome asked Jesus as the mother of the children, and every mother would probably do that for their children, right? But they put her up to it, and so she did. Well, the others found out about it, and it, there was hell to pay. <laughs> They argued all the way to the upper room. They were fighting. And it's kind of like the Smothers Brothers over who mom likes you best, you know, and Jesus likes you best. No, he likes me best. Well, 
And so all the disciples were saying, well, he gave me just the same power to heal the sick and raise the dead. I mean, you know, am I any less than you? And they were arguing over who was the greatest. While they were arguing, still fussing, Jesus took the basin and the towel and just one by one went around the room, didn't say a word. Now, you, at this time, remember, it was only a servant. Back then, they wore sandals, and washing feet was just a custom. It's kind of like some people, when you go to their house, they ask you to take their, your shoes off. I don't know if they were raised in Japan or, but but they, you know, and so you do because, especially if you got white carpet. I've seen people with white carpet. What were they thinking? But you know, you take your shoes off, and you, and it's a a way of respecting that household. Well, washing feet was customary because you just came in off a dusty road, and so a servant would take a basin and a towel, and. And usually there wasn't much fuss made about it because they were expected to do that. And the servant played the role of washing feet and then drying them with a towel. Jesus took the basin and towel and did the job of a slave, a servant. One by one, nobody complained. I'm sure that Judas didn't complain until they got to Peter. Oh, no, you're not going to wash my feet. Uh uh. What did Jesus tell Peter? If I don't do this, you're not a part of this. Okay, well, Lord, how about my hands and my head, too? No, your feet's enough. <laughs> You've already had your bath. So Peter was always over the top, even, even with his requests. And he was that way because he basically was a zealot. As a matter of fact, it would be Peter himself who would take up a sword whenever Jesus was arrested. It was Peter who struck off the ear of Malchus, the servant of the high priest, with his sword. What did Jesus do? He bent on over, picked up that ear off the ground, slapped it back on the fellow's head, and he was healed instantly. Now that ought to get your attention if you're a soldier standing there watching a fellow's ear get slapped back on his head and then mended per properly without a surgery. Uh, and it gives another meaning to lend me your ears, right? Friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ears. Well, he lended him his ear for a minute and Jesus put it back on his head. And, and then he told Peter, put, put away your sword. The crowd that had gathered there was waiting for a signal as to which of the disciples was Jesus. Judas had already arranged for the betrayal and had been paid 30 pieces of silver, you know the story, to surrender Jesus. But here's what's interesting. Satan did not enter, enter into Judas until after Christ had served him communion. And furthermore, he told one of the disciples who asked him secretly who it was, he'll, he said, uh, the, the, the one whom I dipped the sop, which would be the bread, into the wine, and give to him. And as he received the sop, Satan entered him. Now, yes, he had consorted with Satan to, per, to betray Jesus. And there are some who argue that Jud Judas, uh, he thought, that Jesus was going to bring in an earthly kingdom and that the angels would come down and rescue him. And Judas thought that because at this time Jesus had, he couldn't be touched. He would, if you tried to arrest him, he'd, he'd just skip right through the crowd supernaturally. And he couldn't be touched up until this point. But what Judas didn't know was that he was the son of perdition as the Bible de de describes him. And Jesus said it would be better for that person had he not been born. He betrayed the Son of Man with a kiss. And we're going to get to that next week. But tonight, I want you to focus on the meal. And we, we read it in John's Gospel, which kind of covered it pretty well. 
and we have it in other gospels as well, that on the night in which he was betrayed, that very evening, he took the bread and broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, take and eat, this is my body broken for you. Now, now the cross has not happened yet. Can you imagine their, their shock when he said, I'm changing the Passover meal? That would be like coming into a Lutheran church saying we're going to get rid of the green hymnal. Which, by the way, you haven't always used. Uh, the red one was the service book you used before that. and A lot of people don't realize that. You know, we think that this one's kind of real special, but that's the feminists got a hold of this one, too. And it got worse with the, with the ELCA, the new red hymnal. You just don't want that one at all. Although there's some nice songs in there. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's just as bad as venerating Mary into deity. She's not deity. She's human. She's not the mother of God. She's the mother of Jesus. The Holy Spirit touched her, and the physical human Mary had the baby Jesus, who was fully human and fully God. That was his divine nature. But he was not so much God that he wasn't a man, and he was not so much a man that he wasn't God. It's kind of a, an anomaly. Trying to explain the Trinity, for instance, to a child would be a similar situation. You know, some people have tried to simplify it. Well, God is three peas in a pod. Or he's a three-leaf clover. Or, you know, a triangle. And we have all these different images we have for God. But God is Father, God is Spirit, God is Son, but the Spirit is not the Son, and the Son is not the Father, and nor the Spirit. So we, we've got this unity, three in one, yet three separate personalities. Now, just look at me, and it explains it pretty well. I seem to have split personalities. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But in reality, you do have a body, right? And you have a soul, according to the Bible. And you have a spirit. So we can look at our own physical nature and see that we're created in the image of God. And our spirit will live forever. We're, that's the part of us that's created in God's image. You are an eternal being. And even the humanist and the atheist and the scientist who puts all their faith in science, all of these people will someday acknowledge that God is the creator and the father of us all. And every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Even the Buddhist, the Muslim, everybody, everybody's going to bow to the lordship of Jesus Christ. Because he is the only one that I know of from any religion that came out of a grave. We still have the tooth of Buddha on top of a pachyderm. When that elephant walks through the streets, they, they venerate and worship a tooth. We serve a risen Savior. I'd say that's a little different than, you know, kissing Buddha's tooth, right? And, and what about the Buddhists? You know, they think God is in everything. Well, he's not. You know, God's not in that, that lamp over there. I mean, he, you, you can kind of go nuts with this thing about it, when you're going to keep coming back as another, in another life form. And I heard, a, I thought, a Christian musician talking about resurrection and he seemed to imply that you just come back in a different form and I'm glad I don't believe in reincarnation because elsewise as I told you before you're all murderers if you believe in the, re in the reincarnation if you've ever hit a deer or a gnat or a mosquito or a bug on your windshield going 70 miles an hour. And I bet you there's a bunch of them on the front of your car right now. Maybe. Especially during love bug season in Florida. That's a really, you really see it then. But you, you'd have to slow down to literally a, maybe a mile or two an hour to keep from killing your relatives if you're, if you're really believing that you're going to come back in another life form. You know, I got to thinking, what would I be if I came back? And I was hoping maybe a fuzzy bunny, you know, or something cute. 
truth is we were in God's image. That's why this doctrine of reincarnation is so diabolical. You don't just keep on coming back. You have one shot at it. And the Bible said it's, it's appointed unto every man to die and after that the judgment. That's what the Bible says. And scripture tells us that we will be reunited with our bodies one day and, our, and when we go to heaven we shall be like him. Like his glorious resurrected body that's what you're going to be like. Well what about, what are we going to, are we going to know each other in heaven? Yes. Will we be male and female and like married couples forever in heaven? No. Well, where do I get that? Jesus said you will be like the angels, neither male nor female. Not given in marriage in heaven. Which, that explains why it's heaven. There's no fussing up there. <laughs> don't, don't y'all get mad at me. But isn't it true that if we're spirit beings, that goes beyond male and female. And the part of us that's eternal is our spirit, created by God in his image. I know that when I look in the mirror, I don't see God. I just see a human being who, who's basically flawed, just like you. And every day I'm reminded of my finite existence as I find a new wrinkle or another hair that's turned gray. Or, or another one growing out of my nose that doesn't belong there. Or I've got two coming out of my ear that grow two inches overnight. I, don't, I can't ever get, every time I go to the barber, they gotta cut my ear hairs that just take off like a wild. You ever heard of a March hair? I got a March hair in my ear. And I've got some eyebrows. Any of y'all having this problem? I, I'll be looking at my eyebrows and I got one of them going about three inches. Where'd that come from, you know? Well, anyway, that's another story altogether. We are finite beings, and we get older, and things start to fall apart. And then that song makes more and more sense to me every day. This old house, that you know, singing about this old house, I'm getting ready to meet the saints. Ain't going to need this house no longer. Ain't going to need this house no more, right? And someday, if we live long enough, and we will, uh, things will start to slow down a little bit. And we're not, even Arnold Schwarzenegger found out that you can't be the biggest fella all the time. Now he, I think he's kind of looking like, he's getting a little more like frail, you know. Before you know it, he'll be walking like Joe Biden. <laughs> but here's the good news. We have eternal life living in us now. And what Jesus did on the cross, he instituted a meal to celebrate. No longer do we re remember the Red Sea crossing. No longer do we remember deliverance from Egypt and Pharaoh. Now we remember deliverance from sin and death and eternal life given as a free gift to anyone who would believe. Now what does it take to be saved? Well, Romans 10 says this. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead it says you shall be saved for with the mouth everybody say with the mouth, with the mouth. confession is made unto salvation, made unto salvation. and so with, you're confessing salvation with your mouth and with your heart you're believing it and it produces salvation. You shall be saved. It didn't say might be, could be, should be. It said shall be. If you confess with your heart, with your mouth, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. For with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. We, with our heart, we believe it wholeheartedly, if you will. Right? So, that's kind of my lesson for tonight. So I'm going to stop preaching because I'm starting to meddle. But here's where we are. Think about what he did that night. And as we come forward to receive communion, I want you to remember how many we got here? Two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve. Isn't that pretty cool? Remember the twelve. Now, one of you is not Judas, so don't go home mad. 
But let's receive the Lord's Supper. And I'm going to just do a, a brief liturgy here. I, let's, just do the, let's just do the Putnam liturgy here, which is simple. After a full-course meal and three, three glasses of wine, he said, now I'm going to give you a new Passover. And it's called a, a new and better covenant in the book of Hebrews. I'm going to give you a new covenant or a new promise. And this Passover meal is in my shed blood and in my broken body. <clears throat> and he said, you know, throughout John's gospel, he told us that he's the manna from heaven and that he's the bread of life. And he, he said, he who eats this bread has eternal life, not shall have. But because you eat this bread of life, which is the broken body of Christ, eternal life is resident in you now. That's why we don't fear the grave. We have eternal life, not shall have it. He who has the Son has life. Everybody say that with me. He who has the Son has life. He is the living bread. And as the living bread, when we partake of this body broken for us, eternal life is divinely imparted through that commemoration and the remembrance of his passion, suffering, and death on the cross. So on the night he was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it. This is my body, broken for you. As often as you receive this bread, remember me. Likewise, after supper, he took the cup, the fourth glass of wine. He said, this is the new covenant in my blood. The old, there was, there was no blood other than the animals sacrificed once a year. And if you read Hebrews, you'll find that the high priest had to go once a year to make sacrifice for sins. Jesus on the cross became our great high priest and when he went to heaven after the death on the cross he placed his blood on the mercy seat by the way everything you see at the temple has an exact copy in heaven from the holy of holies to the, the table of showbread to the basin and all of that's in heaven and it says Jesus went into the holy of holies in heaven and placed his blood on the mercy seat and the moment he did it, the veil of the temple was torn from top to bottom, 22 feet high, four inches thick, a veil ripped from top to bottom, giving us access into the Holy of Holies. Now the Jews tried to hide that fact until some 70 AD the temple was destroyed. But the Holy of Holies was basically vacated. Now, I have some people say, well, they're looking for the Ark of the Covenant. Will they ever find it? I doubt it because we find it in the book of Revelation, chapter 11. It says the Ark of the Covenant is up in heaven. Now, did it happen the minute the veil was torn? Possibly. I mean, I, I don't, it doesn't say that, but it certainly tells us that something changed in the Holy of Holies. And the priest hid it from the people. Something changed. So he says, this is my blood of the new covenant shed for you and for many. And he tells us that, that this shed blood brings healing. And it's for our health. And we learn in scripture that, that uh, throughout the centuries, lots of people have been healed taking communion. By, here's what Peter said. By his stripes we were healed. And it also says that in Matthew. They got it from the Old Testament. Isaiah, who said, he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we were healed. This is my blood of the new covenant shed for you and for me. For, for remission of sins, as often as you drink this cup, remember me. That's the Lord's commission. That's the new covenant in his blood. And you're invited now to come and partake. As you do, uh, we're going 
going to have some soft organ music here. Let's, let's start with the Lamb of God. He takes away the sins of the world. Can you play that one for us? Would the one who is to assist come forward? <laughs> 